And we're very happy to be with you as we continue our study of the first letter of the Apostle John. Of course, there are three of them, first, second, and third John. <clears throat> we're nearing the end of this one. Before I go any further, I would like to express my appreciation, Josh, for that uh, fine lesson, certainly emphasizing what so many people don't know. To glorify God is to do what he said the way he said it for the reason he said it. And that's the way you obey him. Now, it's interesting as we remind ourselves of uh, why John wrote this first epistle. Because that sets the remote context of the whole epistle. It was so that those he wrote to could have fellowship with the Father and Son, even as the apostles have fellowship with the Father and the Son. And that their joy, therefore, would be made full as Christians. Remember, Christians, they are those who are all Christ. The emphasis in the whole letter is that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the only begotten Son of God, that he truly came in the flesh, as John had said in John 1, 1 and 2, and verse 14. And thus, in combating this early form of Gnosticism, where some taught that Christ didn't even come in the flesh, some that he uh, appeared to come in the flesh, he is really coming down hard, we might say, common terminology on proof that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is very God as well as very man. That there is a dual uh, state of being with Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He is unique because he's the only being that is like he is. His spirit is deity, yet he took on himself the form of humanity. There's not anybody else like that. It also reminds us that in becoming a man, that he devotes himself of the form of deity. I didn't say he ceased to become deity. That's an impossibility. But he gave up the form, whatever that form is, of deity. I don't know this much about it. Satan could not. Uh, tempt God and cannot tempt God in the very form of deity. But when he, he divested himself of that form of deity and took over himself the form of a servant, to use Paul's writing, Philippians, and uh, took upon himself the form of a man, and I don't even understand all that means, except he became as human as you are or I am. Thus, he is the God-man. And the first fruits of them that slept, meaning simply, that he was raised from the dead to die no more. Now, John is interested that these people reject any false doctrine, but he's dealing primarily with the one I've already mentioned. Now, I left off last week in uh, verse 5, with verse 5. We had a few minutes, very few minutes, but we had some left, but I didn't want to get into these next few verses at that time, simply because they are considered to be some of the more difficult verses to get the meaning of. So let's see what we can do with it tonight. In verse 6, he says, this is he. Let's analyze this as we go. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood, and is the spirit that beareth witness, because the spirit is true. Well, first of all, look at the verse. First part of it, we see there's a person. This is he. Masculine pronoun, this is he. Who is it? It's Jesus Christ. What else? Jesus Christ, that person, came by water and blood. Notice then he emphasizes it. He didn't just come by water only. But water and blood. Now let's go with that sentence first. Because after verse 5. Which is a question mark. He ends up going into verse 6. And I read the first sentence. Comprising part of verse 6. 
When Jesus began his earthly ministry, it was at his baptism. You'll remember that he came to John, the forerunner, the immerser, the baptizer, who was sent to get the Jews ready to receive their anointed one, the Messiah, the Son of God. Thus, all of the Jews needed to be baptized for the remission of their sins. Now, Mark chapter 1 and verse 4 tells us that John's baptism for the Jews was a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Well, now they approached God under the authority of Moses and the law of Moses. Jesus lived and died under the law of Moses. And as a Jew, according to the flesh, then all of his time on earth was spent serving God as the law of Moses taught. Well, then why did he need to obey John's baptism, since it's the baptism of repentance, for unto, in order to a given end, which was the remission of sin. Well, John wondered that too. He says, uh, why do you come to me? I need to be baptized of thee and not the other way around. Well, Jesus made it clear to him that I am a Jew according to the flesh, your message is to the Jews. Thus, it behooves us to fulfill all righteousness. Well, remember, Righteousness defined would be the commandments of God. As a Jew, he had a responsibility to obey the commandments of God. And remember, Jesus was flawless and never violated the commandment of God in thought, word, or action. So therefore, he submitted to John's baptism as a Jew because it was for the Jews, but not for the remission of sin. But that marked the beginning of his earthly ministry. Now, what happened? as he is brought up out of the water. Remember John's point about water here. Well, there's a dove or the appearance of what looked like a dove that came on him, and that was, according to John, the Holy Spirit descending upon him. Other passages tell us he received the Spirit without measure, without measure of what? Without measure of power. We can talk a lot more about that, but nevertheless, that's what it said. Implications of it are rather interesting, but then the voice of his father in heaven spoke. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. So he's born of the water. Notice what you have here. This is he that came by water and blood. Now, God does do something by accident. We all know that. Jesus started off at the point of his baptism. And that's marked by water. Baptized by the very one who was his forerunner. And who would later see him coming not long after this and say, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Now, then he says, water and blood. Not water only, but water and blood. Well, the chief thing about our Lord's sacrifice in him offering his body a sacrifice, giving his life, is that he shed his blood. So he terminates his earthly ministry. And it's interesting he uses the terms, it is finished. It was finished in blood. And the blood of Christ was shed in his death, thus to become a Christian. One is, according to Romans 6, 17 and 18, and verses 3 and 4 of that same chapter, buried with the Lord in baptism, baptized into his death. Well, in his death, he shed his blood. And he said, it's finished. I've come to do all that's necessary to do as far as deity is concerned to save man from his sins. And again, I invite you back to go read um, Isaiah 53 and to see how he became a propitiation and appeasement for our sins. Now, remember, John wants these uh, people, these brethren, their fellowship to be full. Have the same fellowship with the Father and Son that the apostles do. Thus, he's writing this letter. So that's the broad context of the letter. Now, when he comes down to this, 
He is simply emphasizing once again, and that would be especially important to those who claim Christ did not come in the flesh, or that he just appeared to come in the flesh. Because he says it started at the water and ended at the blood. Even Jesus Christ. Notice how he emphasizes, not by water only. It didn't just begin and end at our Lord's baptism. But water and blood. Now, the latter part of this verse is another sentence. Starts it, as we have in English, with a conjunction. And it is the spirit that beareth witness because of the spirit, because the spirit is true. Now, today, I'm reading to you from the plenary verbal inspired word of God. Not an inspiration like Shakespeare or Milton had, but it means the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, guided these apostles infallibly to write what they wrote. So all scriptures given them inspiration of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16. Thus, John writing to these Christians, and of course writing part of the New Testament, is emphasizing that which would help them over this false doctrine. That they could remain in fellowship with the Father, even the apostles are, that they could have their joy and that it would be full. So the Spirit bears witness. Paul talks about this in Romans 8, about the Spirit bearing witness. Well, how does the Spirit bear witness? Well, first of all, if we understand much at all about the work of the Holy Spirit. We realize he is a revealer and the confirmer. That's his part as the third person of the Godhead, to reveal and to confirm. So we see then that he bears witness, gives his testimony and he's the one that was there at the very beginning, who in the form of that which looked like a dove came and set up on Christ's baptism was the Holy Spirit. And he gave our Lord power without measure. I, I will comment further on what I said earlier, and I mentioned this, at least to add this to it. When our Lord divested himself of the form of deity, there were limitations placed upon him. And when we see our Lord doing various miracles, I conclude from that, though I wouldn't be dogmatic on it, that it was via the third person of the Godhead that he did all those miracles. And the Spirit was without measure given to him, and that doesn't just happen by accident. It was the reason that the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, gave him immeasurable power and authority. After all, as the executor of the Father's will, the second person of the Godhead, still in the form of deity before coming to earth as a man, didn't need that. And of course, all this is said on our level of understanding, so we can express it best that what he did in the way of miracles and so forth was by the power of the Holy Spirit as a human being. And that would um, account for a great number of things. But our understanding of that has to be limited because we don't have enough revelation about all of it, or what all is even entailed in the Incarnation. But I say that simply to point out that it's the Holy Spirit who is the one that bears witness. Now, he does it through the truth. The Holy Spirit today bears witness to you and to me as to whether we are children of God or whether we're not. How does he do it? To merely state the fact that he so does does not tell us the means why, but whereby he does. Everything's not found in one sentence or one verse or a few verses sometimes. So we have to see what all the Bible says on the matter. And here, it's rather obvious, I think, that it's the Spirit that gave Christ his powers to work miracles that prove he was from heaven who he claimed to be the Son of God and not of man or of the devil or somebody. And uh, John seemed to think that was very so, not seemed to, he did. In John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing you might have life through his name. 
Now, this same John, inspired of the same Holy Spirit, writing to Christians that their joy might be full, that they could remain in fellowship with the Father and Son as the apostles are. Thus, they would have to meet this false doctrine and overcome it. What was it? Christ didn't come in the flesh, or he appeared to come in the flesh. But, uh, but um, John's making it clear as you go from the beginning of this letter all the way up to here that obviously Christ came in the flesh. The Holy Spirit witnessed that. He gave testimony to it. And he tells you why he would, because the Spirit is truth. Now, as you go back to John, Gospel of John, Gospel of Catholic, the chapters 14, 15, 16, as I've referred to a new, numerous times, you'll see Jesus talking about him going back to heaven following his uh, death, burial, resurrection. Well, how would the apostles accomplish what Jesus called them to do? Thus, he says, I'll send you another comforter. A paracletos, a paraclete, the word comforter is under fully, and there is no one English word that does, fully translate the paracletos relationship that the Holy Spirit had with the apostles. So I often say, in trying to explain it, that if you understand the relationship Jesus in the flesh had with the apostles while he was on earth, then the Holy Spirit took up that same association with them enabling them even to work miracles to prove that what they preached was the word of God, not the word of man. So John is saying it's the Holy Spirit that bears witness. The Holy Spirit bears witness today. How? Through the truth. Remember, it was Jesus who said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And pre preceding that, verse 32 and 31, he says, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. So it's the Holy Spirit via the word which reveals the truth whereby we understand what's right and what's wrong. So Jesus prayed in John 17, 17, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Well, who revealed the word? The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. It's the word, the seed of the kingdom, the sword of the spirit that creates faith in Christ within us as we understand it. It's that same word that guides and leads and directs us as members of the church, Christians, saints of God. Even as this letter is written to Christians, that they would remain in fellowship as the apostles are in fellowship with the Father and Son, that their joy might be full. So then when the Spirit bears witness with our spirit, it's through our understanding of the word of God. I can read the Bible. I can understand what Christ requires of me to become a Christian. I can know whether I am going to submit to it or rebel against it. And when I obey the gospel, I'm baptized into Christ. I know the Lord added me to the church. Is there a certain feeling about that? No. I read the Bible, and the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, as Luke wrote it in Acts 2, 47, tells me the Lord did that. It's the only way I know I'm added to the church by the Lord, because the Holy Spirit told me so. How'd he tell me? Through words. The truth manifested in those words. How do I know that God's will pleases my worship? I must honestly go to the Word and study what it says concerning how God will be worshipped. This is imperative if we're to understand what John is doing, that he's strengthening Christians. Now, they heard the gospel sometime long before this, maybe some not so long, some longer. And they believed and obeyed it. They were baptized into Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Now he wants them not to be caught up in some false doctrine. Remember, it was Paul who said in 1 Timothy 4, now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Who spoke? The Spirit. What did he speak? Words. Expressly. Plainly. And then Paul tells them about the great falling away and that would come. Well, the Spirit speaks to us the same way today. And he tells us God's will and we can review our own lives in the light of it. That's the very point of James' letter to Christians. 
in James 1, verse 25, whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continue therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. Now, he continues on in verse uh, 8. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the spirit and the water and the blood. These three agree in one. Now, look at the latter part of it first. These three agree in one. Well, keeping in mind what I said earlier, if that be the, the proper understanding, then the spirit and the water and the blood all have their place in the great scheme of redemption. Christ started his ministry when he was baptized in water. He did it to fulfill all righteousness because he was a Jew and the command was to Jews, though he didn't have any sin to be forgiven. And he had none therefore to repent of. And then we look and see that the Spirit gave his testimony. And the Spirit came upon him without measure of power. And then, of course, he terminated his whole earthly existence in blood. And he would even say, this is my blood of the New Testament. And the writer of Hebrews spends a great deal of time showing that the blood of bulls and goats couldn't take away sin. It would take the blood of Jesus Christ because he was sinless. Thus, he could appease God on our behalf because, as Paul said, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. Something had to take place. God had to be appeased. Who was the one to do, it, to do it? It was Jesus. And this is the point being made here. In effect, John's saying, this hasn't changed. And in dealing with this false doctrine and assuring yourself to remain in fellowship as the apostles are with the Father and the Son, then you need to understand all of these three fit together like a puzzle, I guess we could say. So there are three that bear witness on in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood. These three agree in one. Now, watch what he does as he challenges their mind and ours. In verse 9, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. Well, John gave testimony to the fact that Jesus Christ was truly the Son of God. Remember, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There's a lot more we could say about that as to John's own understanding of things, but that's that's a matter of fact as far as scriptures are concerned. So the witness of God is greater. Well, who do we know would be that witness? Well, he said up here earlier in verse 8, and there are three that bear witness in earth. In the very first one, he says the spirit and the water. And the blood. Now, some people might want to say, and I did mention this a moment ago, that when you read that in verse 8, the spirit, uh, the first letter is, uh, as we would say, a little letter S. It's not a large letter S. We usually read in our English versions the capital S and say that means Holy Spirit. Small S means the spirit of man. Well, I assure you, in the Greek language, that does not always work. Some of that's done by the translators and their understanding of when it's Holy Spirit and when it's not. Some of it by the context is very obvious it's the Holy Spirit or very obvious that it's the spirit of man. As I often say, the real you that dwells in this fleshly body and will as a center of personality specifically as you are, leave it. As James says, the spirit apart from the body is dead. Well, he couldn't be talking about the Holy Spirit there. First of all, the Holy Spirit doesn't have a body. And next of all, the Holy Spirit doesn't die. So it's obvious from that that he's talking about the death of a human being. But here I suggest to you that even if it is the human spirit, he's already told us how we, our human spirits, can know what's right and wrong with God. It's by receiving the testimony of the Holy Spirit. So one way or the other, it gets back to the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, we've mentioned the water and what I think this means, and the blood, what I think that means. I won't repeat it. So 
Then he says, for this is the witness of God, which he had testified of his son. For the witness of God being greater, I think, is simply the Holy Spirit. If you would believe the testimony of men, and you got to remember, under the law of Moses, everything was to be established among men in the mouth of two or three witnesses. And when it comes down to charges leveled against the elders, be two or more witnesses before you receive that accusation. Uh, when an individual who sins against another individual Christian, according to Matthew 18, and the only known to those two in God, then it begins with the one being sinned against going to the one who did the sinning. But if he doesn't gain his brother, he doesn't bring the sinner to repentance, he's to take again two or three witnesses. So the greatest witness that we have is the Holy Spirit himself. First of all, Christ had the Spirit without measure. Next of all, look at what you have as the church began in Acts chapter 2. Have all those manifestations of the Holy Spirit. When God saw fit, saw fit to show Peter and all the others, Jews in particular, that uh, uncircumcised Gentiles had a right to the gospel as much as they did. It's the Holy Spirit that comes on the house of Cornelius, directs from heaven, and causes them to speak in other languages they'd never studied. And all Peter could think about was this is what happened to us as it, uh, at the beginning. So the Holy Spirit has left his imprint. It's always in the form of the truth. Now, he talked about earlier up here, and I didn't mention it in verse 6, because the Spirit is truth. Well, these are the essence of truth. It doesn't mean that the third person of the Godhead is uh, true in the sense of uh, the truth that he manifests. Again, this means he's the revealer of it and the confirmer of it, and he's all involved in it because it's the Father in whom all truth inheres and all authority inheres. He delegated then that authority to the Son, and Christ said, all authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28, 18. But it was the Holy Spirit who has revealed all of this. I invite you to read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and see where Paul simply points out, and I'll paraphrase it, that the third person of the Godhead reveals the mind of God to us because he is God. And just as your spirit is the only one among men that can truly reveal what's on your mind, then so it is one of the Godhead three, in this case the Holy Spirit, who reveals what's on the mind of God. And thus, we have the way that truth of the gospel got on this earth. The whole Christian system was via the revelation of the Holy Spirit. Um, one time I was trying to study with a man in my first local work. His daughter had been coming to church, and she wanted me to talk to him. And when I went out to visit with him, we didn't get even through one study. Because he immediately told me at the beginning, he says, I don't accept anything from the New Testament for what Jesus himself said. I guess you'd call him a red letter edition Bible student. But I simply paused for a minute and I said, well, how do you know what Jesus said? Well, I can read right here what he said. I said, all you have is what Matthew said he said. Mark said he said. Luke said that Jesus said. And John said what Jesus said. You don't know anything that Jesus said straight from Jesus by him writing it down while he was here. And thus that tells us how the Holy Spirit revealed all those things in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about the life of Christ. And thus that's how we have it. So that kind of testimony is here and without the revelation of God, specifically the New Testament, you're not going to become a Christian. You're not going to live the Christian life. And John knows that. So if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For well, this is the witness of God, which he had testified of his son. Thus, we believe in quoting the scriptures because they are the instrument the Spirit uses to convict men of sin, convert them to Christ, and to keep them faithful. And John specifically is dealing with this particular sin among these people that it not lead them away from the Lord. And this is the approach that he took. Now, verse 10, he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. Well, faith comes by hearing the word of God. The word of what? The word of God. There's no proper faith, confidence, trust in God and Christ without revelation. The revelation of God's will. Thus, our faith 
our confidence, our trust in Christ is by the word of God. Can't come from any other source. Oh, you say, well, what about nature? Well, you come to a general understanding of the power of God, the glory of God. You'll never know what God requires of a person to do to become a Christian or to live a Christian life by contemplating the heavens or a tree or a bug under a microscope or whatever else. All those things by design say God exists. But you can know God exists all day long and lose your soul and go to hell simply because you have to know his will. That will does not come except by revelation. That's the very point of 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And John's writing part of it right here as far as part of the New Testament is concerned. And he writes it infallibly because the Holy Spirit guides him as he did all the human and hands that wrote the New Testament. And thus, God is saved the truth on earth. He that believeth on the Son hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not, God hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave his Son. Notice that it all comes back to the word of truth. It all comes back to the seed of the kingdom. It all comes back to the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Thus Paul said, preach the word. And that's what we do because there is the source of faith. There is the way that these people at that time when the letter was written, the folks who originally received it, were to be able to ward off this false doctrine that Christ did not come in the flesh. No, the scriptures teach that he did. And that's what they had heard when they were converted to Christ. And remember, we've already seen early on uh, in the study of the book, or earlier in the study of the book, that they had an anointing or an unction from the Spirit. They didn't have a fully revealed, written down New Testament. But God expects them to be faithful. So he gives them the nine miraculous gifts. And where did they come from? They came from the Holy Spirit through the laying on of apostles' hands. First Corinthians chapter 12, and actually 13 and 14. And when you look at the account of the gospel going to Samaria, it was Philip who preached it. Philip could work miracles, but he could not impart a gift to any of those people that he converted. So as soon as the church in Jerusalem hears about the church being established in Samaria, they send Peter and John there. There's only one reason Peter and John went there. That was to lay hands on members of that church so they could have the miraculous gifts that they might know how to live as Christians uh, for a good period of time. And that's exactly what happened, and I have no reason to believe it didn't happen every time the Word of God went somewhere in that infant stage of the church. So here we see John working hard because they're free moral agents. They've got to be willing to receive it. If they don't want to receive it, they're not. It doesn't make any difference about the evidence. If you don't receive it, you won't. And we see that a whole lot in our nation today. A great many things not having to do with religious matters. The facts are in, but people turn a blind eye to them. And thus they do not see and they do not reason correctly from the facts to the conclusion they ought to. And that's how you blind yourself. Just reject the obvious. Well, what's obvious? Fact. That's what happened to the leaders, the rulers of the Jews with Jesus. They saw as much uh, from him as anybody else did that should have proven to them that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah. But it didn't. And they even were so hard-hearted, they said, well, yeah, you work miracles, but you do it by the power of Satan. And when the Lord refuted that, it didn't change them, did it? So it's one thing to prove something conclusively. It's quite another to prove it to somebody conclusively. Not because it's any fault of yours or weakness on your part. It could be, but not necessarily. It's simply because people can be honest and they can be dishonest. And they can want error and they can want truth. And if they don't want the truth, they enjoy the error they're in, then the Son of God couldn't reach them. Thus, Paul would ask the Thessalonians in their prayers for him that one of the things they pray for is that he'd be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men 
have not faith. There's not anybody that's going to have the faith in Christ that saves them if they're unreasonable. And thus Paul stood before Felix in reason of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. And thus the preaching of the word, which is done correctly, involves appealing to the rational nature of man. That's where we take in the facts, reason with them, and draw a definite conclusion. And when we do, we must bring the will into the matter. Because I can reach that conclusion and still not obey the truth that I've learned. So I must be humble and meek and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save my soul. So as we go on further with this, he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. Well, of course you do, because you have the word of God, the sword of the Spirit in yourself. You understand it. You've applied it. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar. Well, you don't make God a liar, but it's a way of simply saying that if you reject the testimony of the Spirit, you're just calling God a liar. And that certainly testifies not to believe, but to rank unbelief. And he says, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. Yes, there's a record that God has given of his son. And uh, we see it in the prophecy, or more specifically in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then in his last, complete last will and testament. And that's the way that the New Testament is to be thought of as the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. That would destroy this idea of, well, when Christ was on earth, he did thus and so. But Christ is not on earth. He's going back to heaven. And I cannot know what is right or wrong except from the Holy Spirit revealed the word of God, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So I dare not fall in the category of saying, well, yeah, that's what the Bible teaches, but I don't care. And I'm afraid a great many people have. They might not be bold enough to say, I don't care, although I've run into a few that have. I've had one person tell me one time, in an irate fashion, I don't care what the Bible says. Well, as soon as that was said, I didn't waste my time any longer with that person. Because until that person is uh, of the disposition of mind, to look at the Bible as the revealed mind of God, as the final revelation of God to man. There's nothing else I can do but say, well, all right, if it's the way you feel, then uh, when I can, and you ever have a change of mind on that, I'm here to help you. I know that to be the case because the Lord couldn't do any better than that, and I can't outdo him. I stretch the imagination. So, and this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Well, remember, these folks are not outside of Christ. These folks are Christians. Whatever it takes to be, become a Christian, they did. Well, from the rest of the Bible, I know they've been brought to a saving belief in Christ. I know they've repented of their sins because you can't become a Christian without doing that, Acts 17 and 30. I know that they have been willing with the mouth to confess that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, Romans 10, 9 and 10. And I know they've been baptized into Christ because he says there at this point in his son. Well, how do you get in his son? Read the New Testament as many times as it takes to read it and understand it. And you'll never find any other doorway into Christ other than for the penitent believer to be baptized into Christ. Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. So, and this is the record uh, that God has given to us eternal life. Now, you've been dealing with that. And we talked about that earlier, so I won't repeat myself. But notice we must stay in the Son. We must stay faithful to God in the Son. It's interesting. We might say we must stay where Christ put us in the sense of faithfulness in the spiritual body of Christ, which is the church. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Again, an emphasis on the importance of our obligation to do whatever is necessary as children of God to be faithful as God requires children of God 
to be faithful. Now, notice how he turns back here in the next verse. These things have I written unto you. Well, who are these people he's written to? I've written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. Now, that doesn't just mean that you believe that the name of the Son of God is Jesus Christ. That means you believe on the authority of Christ. But believe on the name that ye may know. Well, again, there is that solid stand that ye may know. No ifs, ands, buts about it. No doubts. But ye may know that ye have eternal life. If we see things in our lives that are amiss, that is, that transgress the will of heaven, sins of commission or omission, and we will not take care of them, there's no use thinking that we have eternal life. It's very obvious from reading Galatians that Paul told the Galatian brethren, so all Christians everywhere, you see a, a brother uh, overtaken in a trespass or fall. Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness and considering yourself. So the idea is that we have an obligation to our brethren that if they get overtaken in a trespass or a fall, we have an obligation as the totality of the Bible's own correct discipline teaches to win that person back to Christ. So if anybody who's honest with God, with the Bible and with himself or herself sees that they are not in harmony with God's will, and then they won't do anything about it, and that's going to come up here in a minute, then that person doesn't have eternal life. There's no hope or expectation of heaven when they die. So, But he wants them to believe on the name of the Son of God. That's an active belief. It's the kind of belief, and I've had occasion to refer to this several times earlier in this class, in James 2, that it's not just a matter of saying that's what the Bible teaches and that's what Christians are going to do, and I know it. It's a matter of putting it into practice. Christ is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Not unto all them that know what the Bible says. Not unto all them that say God is, the, is, is existent in Christ is his son and so forth. But it's those that obey him. So in verse 14, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. But I think that's quite plain. Uh, he doesn't say here, I will answer your every prayer in just exactly the way that you ask it and what you request it. But he does hear us. God, who's infinite in his wisdom, omniscient, knows what, I think I've had occasion to say this other times, knows what we need, not what we want. Sometimes our wants are not what we need. So I think uh, when we get to heaven, one of the great things we can thank God for is when he did not give us certain things we prayed for. But he said no, or else he said later on, or maybe to come in a different way. But notice confidence is here. With knowledge, there comes confidence. This is the confidence that we have in him. It has to do with prayer. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears it. That's not the end of the sentence. It goes on over to verse 15. And if we know that he hears us, and we do go, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have our have the petition that we desire to be. What it comes down to is this, you're his child. You know, as a parent, you don't grant every little thing your child wants. At least you shouldn't. Well, then the father's going to withhold for us things that are not good for us, though we may think they are. Or he may grant us some things in a way that we didn't anticipate and allow us to go through things that we just soon not. And I simply refer you back to the book of Job and to see how he also tested Abraham's faith. And that's part of life on earth. If you're going to be a Christian such as Paul was or Timothy, then we are expected to take these tests of faith to where our confidence in God and his will, the gospel system, is put to the test. That's all part of being in God's schoolroom of life and as we follow the Bible. And you see, our confidence in him is that we know he would not lead us in, the path, in a way or down a path that would hurt us. 
whatever's going on that's because we obey the truth in, at all costs is for our good. And thus, Paul would talk about himself being the prisoner of the Lord. We don't think about that enough. What Paul's saying is that in order to do what Christ called me to do, I am where I am. And he had to appeal to Caesar. Thus, he was a prisoner the last days of his life for quite some years. And yet he says, since that's part of what it takes for me to be faithful to God and to accomplish what he called me to do, then I'm the prisoner of the Lord. And that would make a great deal of difference when we have to deal with things in this life that are not pleasant. And yet we know from a study, an honest study of the Bible, we're doing God's will. Well, then why do these things happen? Because they're necessary to our forming Christ within us and making our character in the likeness of him. Let's see if we can cover this next part, and then I'll end the class tonight. If any man see his brother in a sin, which is not unto death. Let's stop there for a moment. Here's something we can observe. It's something we can observe in a brother. And that something is sin. Sin, as we've already seen from this uh, book, this letter, 1 John 3, 4, is the transgression of the law. So we can see a brother who's engaged in sin or guilty of sin. But now he says, this sin is not unto death, unto in order to give an end, which is death, which is separation from God. Well, I thought all sin separated us from God. Well, how is it, can there be a sin that's not in order to give an end, which is death or separation? Well, he tells us, before I answer that question, that we who are faithful, if we see a brother guilty of sin, but it's not whatever the sin and the death is, then we can ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. But notice about the one, what he says in the last sentence of this verse. There is a sin unto death. And I do not say that he shall pray for it. How do I know that there's a sin unto death when I observe a sin in my brother's life? Well, don't forget everything else you've learned in the Bible about Christians helping their fellow Christians to be faithful. Remember all the scriptures that talk about our obligation to deal with an erring brother? And that erring brother sees his error or her error and renounces it from repentance, confesses it. Then our prayers for that person's forgiveness will be heard. Can I see a brother sin a sin that isn't a death? Yes. Yeah. Let him commit sin, not repent of it. That's under death. Can we see a brother who has committed a sin that's not under death? Yes. When he repents of that sin and we pray for it, it's not under death. It's that simple. So what are we to do with our brethren? What are they to do with us? Would they help each other go to heaven? What all does that entail? Part of it is pointing out sins of brethren's life. And if they repent, then they haven't sinned unto death. We pray for them. God says they're forgiven. If they are in sin, they rebel in it, they're hardened in it, they will not repent, don't pray for that person. Not for forgiveness. Then we come down to verse 17, and I just can't get any further than this. Uh, it ties into verse 16, all unrighteousness is sin, and there's a sin not unto death. I think I've explained that as much as I can. The sin not unto death is a sin that a brother will repent of. We'll not continue in. We'll heed the other brethren's efforts to get him to turn from that sin. I think the best example is a good place to end. The best example probably is Paul, the Apostle Paul, who's standing Peter in the thing. Peter did not commit a sin unto death. Obviously, from the totality of information about that matter in uh, that happened in Antioch, Syria, was that Peter repented. And you have the same thing with Simon the Sorcerer when Philip preached the gospel and established the church down in Samaria. And he sinned because he desired the power the apostles had to convey miraculous gifts and sought to buy it with money. Peter rebuked him severely. And then the next response is, please pray for me. 
these things don't come upon me. So what do we see? Well, I can tell from my own life if I'm acceptable to God because I know whether I'm doing God's will or I'm not. On the other hand, if a brother commits sin and I go to him or they come to me, whichever the case is, the sinner, and I repent of that sin, then God hears my prayer and forgives me. That's the reason when people respond with the gospel invitation is brethren, and they want to confess faults, they must have repented of that before they make a confession. The confession is the revelation they've repented. And thus are letting the church know I've repented by confessing. That's God's law, God's law of second pardon in the child of God. Well, we'll close it all out next week and move on into First John, the Lord willing. We thank you for being with us. And before we go, let's have a word of prayer, please. Our Father, we're thankful for thy word. We pray that we'll put forth the mental industry to study it, right, divide it, and gain the truth thou hast for us. Help us realize that all thy truth is for our good. Everything in it is designed to lead us to overcome the wicked one and that heaven may be our home. Help us be mindful of our brethren and their needs. Help us to be instant in prayer to constantly study thy word and meditate on it day and night. Defeat us in evil, raise us up in good. Give us a good night of rest and not our will but thine be done. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.